There we go. Okay, Dr. Rizwana Rumine is a research psychologist, registered counselor, and senior lecturer at the Department of Psychology at Stellenbosch University. And Ms. Laura Hartman is a research psychology master's student who has just submitted her thesis paper on women's health. Thank you both very much for joining us. And I'll hand it over to you now, just some housekeeping for our guests or for our participants. We have collected questions that we received on social media and email that our experts will address. Thereafter, if there is time, we will take your questions and open the floor to the participants. However, in the meantime, you may post messages in the chat box. I will read through your messages and if we have time later on, we will get to your questions and your comments. Uh, you can also send them to me anonymously if you would like to do that. And thank you very much. I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Genevieve. Um, and thank you for inviting us to speak today. So Laura and I are both very interested in health psychology. Um, we've always been. My, my first introduction to health psychology was in first year at UCT. Um, and I think I got more into it when, um, when I did my honors degree at UWC. So it's something that's always been really interesting to me. And, you know, women's health is just, it's an area that I've been interested in since honors as well. So thank you for this opportunity. So a, a little bit about myself. I teach at Stellenbosch University and I do quite a bit of postgraduate supervision. And most of the supervision that I do is in the field of women's health. So Laura is um, someone who's just completed her master's in polycystic ovarian syndrome. I see that another one of the students I work with, Megan Mercer Lisa, is online. She does some work on PMDD. And yeah, I think I'm just very interested in women's health and improving um, the health of women. Um, and we recently started up a, um, a special interest group within CISA called the Health Psychology Special Interest Group. We are on social media, media and we also have a mailing list. So if you'd like to join our group, please send us an email. Um, maybe Genevieve can share our email address um, in the chat or something. Okay. And just contact us and let us know um, because I really would like to grow the field of health psychology in SA. Um, and so I'm gonna hand over to Laura quickly to, to do an introduction. Hello everyone. Um, I did give Genevieve and Rizwana a little heads up about the potential noise you might be hearing in the background. Unfortunately, standard procedure working from home. As soon as you sit down to speak to people on Zoom, there's a whole lot of noise in the background. So apologies about that. Um, so yes, like both Genevieve and Rizwana have said, I have very recently handed in my thesis for my master's degree. And for my thesis, I explored self-image and self-esteem in women with polycystic ovarian syndrome and I used a method known as body mapping which I will I'll expand on my study a little bit later um, but as well as being a master's research student I also work part-time for the Institute of Black Force Health Research um, and I also volunteer as a counsellor for and to give you a bit of insight on how I got into health psychology. Um, I did my undergrad in a, a BSc in human life sciences with psychology. So it sort of married the two interests that I had. Um, and whilst learning about um, human physiology, I learned about quite a few different women's health conditions. And through doing my own research, it became very clear to me, both from that research and from my own experience, that women's health conditions are sadly far underrepresented, uh, both just sort of in general public knowledge and in research. Um, so that's always been something that I've been very interested in. And when I was exploring options for doing my both honors project and my master's project, um, the topic of women's health was at the front of my mind, and particularly um, polycystic ovarian syndrome as it's a disorder that I have myself and have a lot of experience with and have a lot of experience on just how underrepresented and undercommunicated it is. OK, 
Okay, um, Genevieve, can we start with answering the questions that you sent us? Yes, please, that would be fantastic, thank you. Okay, so the first question we received is to elaborate on health psychology. So I guess what you're asking for is what is health psychology? Because I know that there's a lot of interest in it, but people also aren't sure what exactly is health psychology. And, and quite simply, health psychology is concerned with health, but from a psychological perspective. And a lot of the textbooks define health psychology as the scientific study of health um, from um, the study of the, the psychological and the behavioral processes involved in health, illness, and healthcare, and how these processes interact with one another and how they shape our well being. So, when we think about health, we tend to think about illness. We tend to think about symptoms and treatment and diagnosis. And we also tend to think about going to the doctor and taking medication. But most people don't actually think about health from a psychological perspective. But psychology actually determines quite a bit of our health behavior. So psychology determines how we experience living with a condition or an illness, so if it's chronic or whether it's acute. It also tells us a bit, of, it, it also influences how and when we seek help when we have symptoms. And then finally, it also looks at how do we adhere to the treatment that's prescribed to us and how and why don't we adhere to treatment that's prescribed for us. So our thinking and our behavior is very important because it can help us to promote healthy behavior. But we also know that humans are quite complex. So sometimes we know what good or healthy behaviors are, but we don't always practice them. So for example, we all know that you need to have a balanced diet, exercise regularly, limit your intake of caffeine, not take any nicotine, um, not, ab not abuse any substances, and try to avoid stress. But it's not as easy as knowing to do these things that gets translated into doing them. Right, so as psychologists, we're very interested in, in improving people's lives. So we want people to live longer and to have a good quality of life. And for that, our aim is to understand behavior and to develop interventions that can promote health. So that's really the focus of health psychology. And if we look now at what's happening in the last couple of years, we can see that health psychology is not only about non-communicable or, non or chronic diseases, it also plays a role in understanding transmittable or, or communicable diseases, such as COVID-19. So health psychologists are very really interested in what's the impact on, of COVID-19 on people's lives, but also they can play an important role in changing behavior and promoting positive behavior. So we all know that the messaging is, to, um, is, is for us to uh, wear masks, sanitize, um, wash our hands regularly and social distance. But people don't always do that. And so I think how psychologists are interested in. So why do some people do it? Why don't they do it? And how do we get people to engage in pro-health activities or pro-health behavior? Right? So I guess in a nutshell, that's what health psychology is and why we do it. And that's the first question. Um, I'm going to move on to the second question. And that is, how does one become involved in the field and what qualifications are needed? So in South Africa, there isn't a category as health psychologist. Um, so you can't register as a health psychologist with the Health Professions Council of South Africa. In other countries, it is a recognized category, the way we have clinical counseling research registered counselors. So for example, in the UK, if you want to be a chartered health psychologist, you need to complete an undergraduate degree, which is normally three years. And then you do your level one training or stage one training. And this is a master's in health psychology. 
After that, you have to complete level two training, which differs across the UK. At some places that is a PhD in health psychology and at others it's supervised clinical training for a minimum of two years. And once you've completed these tasks, you can register as a chartered health psychologist. Um, in the States, it's also quite similar. So you do an undergraduate degree and then you do your um, and then you do a master's degree. But in the States, the difference is that you must have a PhD to be a health psychologist. So as I said, we don't have this in South Africa. And so most people who are interested in health psychology do so from a research perspective. So if you are interested in the field, do a master's or a PhD or both in health psychology, um, but you won't be a health psychologist. We do find that people who are, uh, who are clinical psychologists and counselors, they do practice a bit in terms of health. So for example, they may deliver interventions at improving psychosocial well-being, um, CBT, CBT related therapies and work in areas such as pain management and that all falls under the category of health psychology. So there is a way to sort of practice health psychology without being a health psychologist um, and hopefully in future we can get to a point where we have one of these categories um, registered with the HPCSA. So um, I've done those two questions. I'm going to hand over to Laura quickly, who's going to answer some questions as well. Thank you, Rizwana. So the next question that we had uh, reads, I've seen so many women with PCOS in pain who really struggle to manage their self-compassion. Can you give a practical how-to protocol for women with PCOS that can help them to maintain self-compassion? Also, how would you advise the men in their life to be supportive and remain strong? So, um, for those of you who might have joined later, I did my, um, my master's thesis on polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS as it's um, more commonly known or more generally known. And for those of you who don't know what PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome is, um, it's an endocrine disorder that affects women post puberty and the disorder has a number of symptoms, but I'll name just a few of them. So, um, and some of the more common ones. So there could be issues with fertility, acne, unexplained um, weight gain or inability to lose weight, um, hair loss or hirsutism, um, which is a term for hair growth on the body that's more commonly associated with masculinity. So for example, excessive hair growth on the upper lip. Um, so there's many more symptoms, but those are just a few of the common ones. Um, there's no cure for PCOS at the moment, and there's also very mixed opinion on what the best method of treatment is, and this is largely because um, different people experience different levels of, of effectivity, depending on what treatment method they try, um, but most common approaches to treatment include use of different contraceptive methods, and um, some methods also use, uh, some doctors also prescribe um, hormone treatment, and most commonly the recommendation is to make lifestyle changes and that includes both um, engaging in physical regular physical activity and um, improving diet um, but beyond the effects on health of PCOS, PCOS can also have a very serious detriment, detrimental effect on women's self-esteem and their self-worth and this is something that I know from my own experience with the disorder but also from the work that I've done during my master's um, and the main reason I chose to explore this particular issue is um, because despite how common the disorder actually is, it's largely unknown and not um, very often spoken about. And this was a common finding I found with the women in, in my study. They found that most people in their life didn't know what the disorder was. Um, and for some of them, they even found that some medical professionals didn't even fully understand what their condition was. So you can understand then that that would be a very isolating experience. Um, and because so many of the symptoms affect physical appearance, I wanted to explore how this effect may influence women's self-image and self-esteem. So that's a bit of a lengthy introduction. Um, there's much more to it than that, but hopefully I'll be able to publish some papers on my work soon. And then if you're interested, you can have a look at those. But when it comes to answering your question, I don't think there could ever be a, a protocol for boosting one's self-esteem or self-worth. Um, 
and then obviously how compassionate one is with oneself because experience with self-image and self-esteem and with PCOS as well is so subjective. Um, but I can share some suggestions based off my own experience and the experiences of the women in my study. So firstly, um, education is important. So for the person with the condition, understanding your condition and how it affects your body could be very helpful in boosting your self-esteem and hopefully as a result, your self-compassion. Um, Quite a few of the women in my study reported um, thinking that they were un unable to lose weight because they weren't trying hard enough um, and they experienced a lot of guilt and a lot of self-blame through this. Um, and this belief is obviously made worse when those around you hold the same opinion or and even more so when they verbalize that same opinion. Again, that's, this was the case for a number of the women in my study. Um, but if you understand that PCOS is linked to a greater chance of developing insulin resistance, um, which can obviously affect how easily you're able to lose weight. Um, and furthermore, it's also really, um, insulin resistance is connected to greater androgen production, which again makes the symptoms of PCOS worse and particularly weight gain, weight gain around the abdomen. Um, once you have that understanding, it could then potentially be easier to understand um, how your body works and therefore be less hard on yourself when you're not able to lose weight. I mean, the weight is just an example. There's many other ways that you can understand your condition that might help you to be less hard on yourself. Um, and having an understanding of your own condition may also help you to educate those around you and help them to be more supportive. Um, Another thing that came up in my study, which I think could potentially be helpful for people um, trying to improve their um, self-esteem or improve their self-compassion would be to explore what your ideas of beauty are. Um, so quite a few of the women in my study, as well as myself, um, have admitted to struggling with their perception of their appearance. And this, a lot of them were able to connect this to what their preconceived idea of beauty was. Um, and I mean, this is not news. Um, we've been talking about beauty ideals for years. And while the recent rise of the body positivity movement suggests that there is, you know, hopefully a shift towards more acceptance and breaking down these boxes that we've put or these labels that we put on to appearance and what we identify as beautiful and what we identify as not beautiful. Hopefully we'll be able to wipe that completely, but it's still the case that we do internalize standards of, of beauty based on what we see and what we're told. And unfortunately, um, a lot of the beauty standards for women sort of directly um, contradict the symptoms that women experience with PCOS. So, perhaps an idea would be to explore the um, ideas of beauty that you've internalized and see um, how much of that is things you truly hold as important and how many of those things are because it's what you've been told that this is what a woman should look like so that's just an idea um, and then for partners and for partner support again it's it's very subjective and it does depend on the woman, what the woman with the condition would prefer. So I would only really be able to recommendation, make recommendations from my own experience. And I would remit, uh, recommend maybe just having an honest conversation with your partner and asking them how best you could support them because only they will truly know what they see as support and what they will find helpful. Um, and again, education on the condition could also be hugely um, helpful. So as a partner, educating yourself on your partner's condition um, that could be very helpful in getting understanding about what they may be experiencing so that you're better able to support them but also it equips you with knowledge to educate those around you so that that responsibility to educate others doesn't always fall on the person with the condition so yeah again um there, those are just a few recommendations and i'm sure that there are more um resources online so there's nothing wrong with having a good google um, Google has so many answers for so many things and there's plenty of support groups online, um, which is actually how I found a number of my participants. So joining those, um, joining partners of PCOS um, support groups, there's definitely those as well. You might be able to learn more from other people's experiences that way. Thanks, Laura. I mean, thank you. That, that was a really nice introduction to what PCOS is and, and how it affects women. And I think you're right. You know, like knowledge is a big part of how people can be supported. And I, I think Marius's question was also a lot about self-compassion. 
And we need to understand that it's really hard to have self-compassion when you have low self-esteem, which is what a lot of women with PCOS sit with, you know, because of these beauty ideals that Lorda spoke about, um, what it is to be a woman and, and not meeting those predetermined um, criteria for, for what it is, what women should look like um, that were created by I don't know who. So it's very important that that communication is there. Um, a couple of things that we could and that we can add is that so because women have self, low self esteem or negative self esteem, we may find that they're saying quite a they engage in quite a few negative self statements. Right, so they're saying bad things to themselves, or you know, saying that they're not good enough to themselves. And I think as partners, you need to be cognizant of that. And you need to say, okay, I'm not going to say anything negative. So try not to engage in any negative comments, creating negative comments, even if you think you're helping the person. So don't make that comment about, for example, weight, like Lorda was saying. You may think that you're saying something to help that person, but it really isn't helping them because they probably know and they're trying their best. Um, and another thing that partners can do is really get on board and support the lifestyle changes that women make. So a lot of them engage in things like dieting and exercise. Um, it won't it won't harm to say hi. Let me let me exercise with you today, or you know let's let's eat a similar diet or the same diet, and you know not engage in behavior that could sabotage women's plans to improve their health. So for example, if your partner says, I'm going for a run, don't say, oh no, let's rather sleep in. Um, or don't bring foods that they say they're not eating into the house um, or have it in front of them. So there are many ways that you can support your partner with PCOS. Um, yeah, so Lord, did you have anything to add to that or to the first few questions? No, I think, I think you've summed that up perfectly there. And I, I definitely agree with you that um, engaging with the process that the person is going through is also very helpful because, you know, like it's very easy to um, not make healthy life decisions. You know, exercise does take effort. It does take energy. Um, and a lot of foods that might be more unhealthy or may not help in the process of, of losing weight, you know, they're not as fun as the ones that, um, those, those foods that don't help with weight gain are a lot more fun than the ones that do. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely think that process can sometimes be a bit lonely and it can definitely be difficult. So knowing that you're not the only one doing it and creating a general environment in your home where you're focusing on healthy lifestyle changes for focused on health rather than just, you know, cosmetic adjustments is also really helpful. Yeah, that, that's true. Thanks, Laura. Um, I see that we are already halfway through the session. So I'm going to move on to the next question, which is from Alison. And she says, I'd be interested to know if Dr. Romani has any commentary on premenstrual dysphoric disorder, particularly in SA populations. Is this clinically recognized and diagnosed here? And I'm also interested in how women are using technology to support their health behaviors. And if there are any specific patterns, faces, or platforms, or groups that have been shown to be more helpful or more commonly utilized. So there's two questions in here. The one's about PMDD and the other one is about online health seeking. So I'm gonna answer the one about PMDD first. Um, and maybe I'll just start off by introducing PMDD. So PMDD stands for premenstrual dysphoric disorder. And it's the ugly stepsister or the more severe form of PMS or premenstrual syndrome. So it's thought that PMDD is diagnosed among between three and 8% of women of reproductive age. And a few years ago, we did a study and we, um, we surveyed um, female students at Stellenbosch University. And we found that the prevalence of symptoms for PMDD was actually at 10%. So 10% of our sample weren't diagnosed with PMDD, but they met the criteria for diagnosis using one of the, 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 the much used um, scales for PMDD. 
So that was quite interesting. But the, the exact cause of PMDD is unknown. But what I find the most interesting about PMDD and what makes it PMDD is the onset and duration of the symptoms that women experience. So with PMDD, it's quite specific. Symptoms appear roughly a week before your menstrual cycle begins. And a few days into menstruation, these symptoms magically disappear and, um, and, and then things are sort of normal for the rest of the month until you get to a week before, um, before the period again. So as we can see, there's this timing and this is what makes PMDD um, so special. But the, the impact of all these symptoms impact patients quality of life and it disrupts their lives and it can be quite devastating and in some cases quite debilitating. So I've spoken about the symptoms and, um, you know, we've got different clusters of symptoms. So, for example, there are quite a few psychological symptoms. And these are depressed mood, lack of interest, um, anxiety, irritability, um, a very sudden onset of extreme sadness. And then there are also some physical symptoms and, and just a few are sort of weight gain. Um, and that's sort of just before your period. Um, a weight gain, um, what's the other ones, um, breast tenderness, and, um, and bloating. So those are some of the, the symptoms that we have. But to diagnose, the, the answer to the first part of the question is yes, it is an actual condition. It is in the DSM-5, it's, so it's a recognized condition. And the DSM-5 actually have about seven criteria that a participant, that a patient needs to meet to be diagnosed with PMDD. And so if you suspect you've got PMDD, you actually need to track your cycle with your psychiatrist or your psychologist for a few months. You need to track all your symptoms and you need to track when you, when you experience these symptoms and you sort of mark it off on a calendar. And there needs to be this pattern of symptom expression within the period that makes it um, part of the PMDD cluster of symptoms. So that's very important. And you need to have at least five of these symptoms in, if you're looking at sort of a year of, of tracking your period in sort of five or more of those months. So there needs to be a, a real pattern for us to be able to say, okay, this person has PMDD or not. And then I think the other part of the question is, um, is relating to, to, is this real, right? So PMDD is diagnosed in, psych in South Africa, psychologists and psychiatrists diagnose PMDD. And, um, and, and I think part of the issue with PMDD is that it, it is surrounded in quite a bit of controversy. And part of this controversy comes from um, feminist scholars. And there are quite a few feminist scholars who argue that diagnosing someone with PMDD is sort of pathologizing something that's a natural part of a woman's cycle. And so this is a very interesting, um, it's a very interesting debate, you know, are we using the scientific gaze or the medical gaze on women's bodies? And, you know, it's something that I've grappled with for some time also. And I spoke to a few women with PMDD and I said, so, you know, this is, this is what feminists are saying about PMDD. What's your response to it? And overwhelmingly, women tell me that being diagnosed with PMDD helped them so much because it's the power of labeling something, labeling, understanding what is wrong with it. And with psychology, you know, our goal is to diagnose and to treat. The whole, the whole point of making a diagnosis is so that we understand what is the best way to treat a condition. It's not about labeling and leaving. It's about diagnosis and treatment. So in that way, I feel that it is a very important category and it's probably not diagnosed enough. Um, and I think that there is quite a bit of, of help for patients in diagnosis. So that's my answer to the first part of the question. The, the second part of your question is, um, I've got a shorter response, thankfully. Um, and we know that patients seek 
two things or two or three things online, right? But I'll speak about two. The one is that patients look for information online. And this is, this is where your Google and your WebMD comes in. And a lot of the times patients are diagnosed with something, but the doctors don't give them enough information. They don't have time to tell them everything they want to know about an illness. And so patients commonly use um, online search engines and they search for the illness and they look at, so what's caused my illness? What is my illness? How do I treat it? They look at what the doctors prescribe for them. And then they also engage in alternate, um, in seeking information on alternate forms of therapy. So that's quite interesting. And then the second reason that people use online forms of information is for emotional support. And this is quite different because a doctor can diagnose you and know a lot about the condition you, you're living with. But when it comes to, um, to experiencing it, only other people who have your condition can give you insight into what it's like and can answer all these questions about, is this normal? Am I doing this right? Am I doing the right thing? Um, should I be doing this? Shouldn't I be doing this? And so people seek a lot of information in terms of and support from others. Sometimes they just want assurance. And for women especially, um, especially women with conditions like PCOS and with other diseases like endometriosis that I've researched, when they're diagnosed, they feel quite isolated because they may not know other people with the disease or, or, or with the condition. And what these support groups do is it makes them feel as if they're not alone anymore, that other people also have these conditions. And so there is a sense of relief um, when it comes to, to um, getting support from peers in an online space. Um, and the other advantage is that it can be quite anonymous. It's not someone you see all the time or you know. And this helps people to share sometimes things that can be quite, seems quite embarrassing to them in an online space. So I hope that that answers your, your questions, Alison. Um, and I think I'm going to hand over to Lorda now, who's got a couple more questions that she's going to tackle. Thanks, Roswana. So yes, the next question um, was directed at me and it asked, what inspired me to write my thesis on women's health? So I've touched on it a little bit already, but um, my own experience with a women's health condition, PCOS, um, and my experience with not being able to find a huge amount of information on the condition, that was a huge part of the reason why I wanted to focus my research on that topic. Um, when I was first diagnosed, I didn't even really fully understand the condition from my gynecologist. Um, so I obviously did what most people do when they don't understand something related to their health. I turned to Google and there was just so much conflicting information online and a lot of it was health related and not a lot of it really spoke to how I was feeling emotionally. So that was a huge part of the reason why I wanted to explore that through my own research because I just found nothing available. Um, and at the time, I wasn't even fully aware that support groups for something like PCOS existed. And I found through being part of those support groups in order to um, recruit participants, um, I found a lot of women were speaking about the same things and a lot of them were sharing experiences and supporting each other. But all of that support was quite often happening almost exclusively within those support groups. Um, and the information that they were sharing each other on those experiences was staying within those support groups. And then the woman I spoke to within my study, um, it sort of confirmed my feelings where a lot of them felt that the only people who fully understood or fully had any knowledge about their emotional experience were the other women in the support group. Um, so that was my main um, inspiration for um, wanting to do my thesis in women's health. Women's health is also just something I've always found very interesting. Um, so that's sort of the secondary reason why I wanted to write my thesis um, within women's health. And then the next question that was sort of linked to that question was, um, what advice can you give to students who want to write a thesis on this topic? Um, and I sort of have a two part answer to this question. And the first is sort of general thesis advice. 
um, which I think is important to share, especially considering I've just handed in my thesis. Um, I think it's very important to know what you're signing up for um, because these, uh, doing your master's, um, I mean, doing any degree, but particularly doing um, a master's degree, um, it is difficult and it does require a lot of energy and a lot of time. So it's important that you know what you're signing up for when you do it, because um, doing a master's degree, you want to be able to pour your energy into it and you want the final product that you um, hand in to be something that you can be proud of and something that you feel like you put your all into. Um, so it's important to know that you have the time and the energy to dedicate to it. Um, and sort of with that, choosing a topic that you um, find particularly interesting or something that you're very passionate about is also important because in order to be able to dedicate that time and energy to it, you need to have something that's motivating you, especially because you're gonna spend a lot of time on that topic um, and you'll do a lot of reading on it and you'll do a lot of rereads on your own writing on it. Um, and at times that can, that can be tedious. So I definitely found that my passion for the topic and my interest in the topic was hugely helpful in um, motivating me to do my best at it and to continue to work at it. Um, and, you know, balance is also very important. Um, that's definitely something I struggled with, um, but it is just very important to be able to maintain balance within your life. Um, also just with choosing a topic it's also important to know whether you want to do qualitative research or quantitative research because that obviously would hugely affect the approach that you take with your masters and how you approach your particular topic and how you develop your research question um, in order to decide on what approach you want to take you need to understand what it is you're wanting to explore um, and what answers you're wanting to find and then figuring out what what sort of research design that fits into and then um, with regards to one, um, the question about wanting to um, advise for writing a thesis on this particular topic. So um, I wasn't sure if that meant PCOS in general um, or whether that was women's health, um, but I'm sort of, my answer sort of covers both. But um, I think firstly, knowledge of the topic is very helpful. Um, and I did see in the chat that Tanya is asked, do we need to come from a medical background? So having taken modules on physical health to be involved in health psychology, um, I'm sure later Rizwana might be able to speak a bit more about that. Um, but I, whilst I don't think it's vital to have, um, you know, a degree in something in order to explore a particular topic. Um, for example, I have my own experience with PCOS, but I can't claim to have been an expert on PCOS when I first started um, researching the topic. Um, I also, the whole purpose of doing a degree like a master's is to learn um, and to develop your skills. So I don't think there's anything wrong with um, part of the process helping you to fill in any gaps in your own knowledge. Um, I would imagine that would also help you to decide what you want to present within your thesis because it helps you, if you know what gaps existed in your knowledge, it might help you to figure out what gaps might exist in other people's knowledge. Um, but I do think at least some knowledge of the topic is very helpful because um, from my own experience, um, it definitely helps you to connect to your participants more because um, whether you have personal experience or whether you're just um, fairly knowledgeable about the topic, um, it helps you to understand at least partially what they might be experiencing. Um, and it helps you to approach them in a way that makes them feel heard and makes them feel understood, which um, is important just for treating your participants with the respect that they deserve, but it's also important for creating a very rich um, narrative of the experience and be, being able to gather more data on a particular topic. Um, it also might help to, inter, um, to inform your interview questions. Um, I definitely found that having my own experience with the particular topic was helpful because again, it creates that connect, connection with the participant. And particularly for PCOS, I found it very helpful because a lot of the participants felt um, misunderstood um, and they quite a few of them even communicated that it, it, they felt a lot more comfortable sharing with me because they felt that I understood what they had experienced or at least partially could understand what they had experienced, um, which made them more comfortable to share. Obviously, it's not a prerequisite, um, but a lot of um, 
if you don't have experience with the condition itself, it definitely helps to at least be knowledgeable on the on it, so you can at least um, empathize with what the person what the person might be experiencing. Um, I will just give a warning that having your own experience with the thing that you're exploring does have the potential to create a triggering experience for yourself. Um, and it obviously could also create greater opportunity for bias. And that's why it's very important to continually check in with yourself throughout your research process and also to reflect with your supervisor throughout the experience. And that brings me sort of to my final point on that is that a, group, a good supervisor is crucial. I'm definitely somewhat biased um, as I had a very good supervisor in Rizwana, um, but it really, really did help to know that Rizwana was also passionate about women's health. Um, and I definitely think it would be helpful that your supervisor has experience in or is passionate about the topic that you want um, to, to explore because it will help them to be hands on with your work. It'll help them to support you um, and they will also understand your drive for the project. And um, furthermore, they may even have insights from their own research and their own experience that may help to inform your research process. So yeah, that's just some advice from me. I don't know if you have anything you'd like to add to either of those two questions, Rizwana. I think you did quite a quite a good job, you know, because it's easy to to say um, when you start how how you're going to be perfect at your master's that you you know you think of it and sort of you know both the academic and the emotional aspects of it is you know very much a roller coaster which i'm sure laura can attest to so it's important i mean other than working closely with your supervisor to make sure that you have the right um environment to um to support you and that you engage with other master students and um, because that sort of peer support is also really important. Um, I don't know if you felt that, Laura. Definitely. I mean, it's the same, it's sort of just the same experience that the participants in my study reported to me, you know, being and uh, knowing that the people that you're speaking to have a similar experience definitely makes you feel less alone. Um, and I definitely found that being able to reflect um, with my fellow master's students um, throughout the process was very helpful. In fact, Megan, who's on this call, can attest to that, that, you know, when, when you're struggling, when you've had a late night, it's really nice to be able to speak to someone else who knows what you're going through um, so yeah I definitely agree that peer support is really really helpful and really valuable yeah I agree with that um, so we've got one more question and it's from the CEHO who says you are a registered counsellor and a research psychologist I'm studying registered counselling at the moment BSAC equivalent however the field of health psychology appeals to me but what can I do if I don't get into masters? Can I still contribute to the field or work in, in the field as a registered counselor? Um, so Lesejo, as I mentioned before, there isn't sort of a health psychology masters, but you're probably talking about um, doing a clinical masters and then working with people sort of in, in different health settings. If you can't get in for clinical masters, why not do a masters in research? Um, so one that's offered like at Stellenbosch University, um, where you get to do a thesis um, and then move on and, and do a PhD also if you want. So my, my advice to you would be to, to go on and, and do a master's in research in a health psychology topic that's of interest to you because as Laura said, that's really important. Um, yeah, and then the other thing you could do is get in. I think that as a registered counselor, you are allowed to do short term CBT. Um, and so maybe you can look at interventions or, or do courses that can support that and, and allow you to support people with maybe chronic health conditions, if that's something that you are interested in. Okay. Um, so, I mean, those are all the questions. Genevieve, is there anything else? I was, thank you very much. That has been incredibly informative for, for me as well, personally, um, as, as someone with PCOS. I was going to ask a question that you just touched on now as registered counselors and aspiring psychologists. Um, 
if we have a client who does present with, for example, PCOS, endometriosis, um, how, and you, you did mention short-term CBT, is there a different approach that one should take with regards to, with regards to counseling? Um, so I think if, if you go online, you can look at what sort of short-term therapies there are that can help things. So your CBT may be based on something like um, relieving symptoms of anxiety or improving self-esteem. And so it sort of doesn't really, um, there isn't sort of a specific one for, for PCOS or for a certain condition, but you treat it more generally the way you would with the client, but always be cognizant that, you know, there is a health condition here. These are the symptoms they are experiencing. These are sort of precipitating factors and um, and, and try to, to schedule it or to tailor it around that. So be cognizant of it, but you don't necessarily need to do a specific treatment for PCOS, um, for anxiety in PCOS patients, unless you find some sort of training online and you're able to complete it. You know, then then that's wonderful. But um, but yeah, I, I don't think that that's necessary. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, my next question is: Clients do enjoy self diagnosing, and I mean, as Laura said, and as as you've said, Doctor Rizwana, I mean, the first thing we do is Google. Um, I think it's it's kind of human nature. If we see a client who has self diagnosed. Um, but they haven't seen a doctor, should we insist on referring them or, or continue to encourage them even though they, they have self-diagnosed? Yeah, so I mean, self-diagnosis is interesting. There's also um, something called cyberchondria, you know, which is when people, um, they overly... Google and about their symptoms and they frequently visit the doctors themselves. So with them, you don't really need to worry because they will be at the doctor three times a week. Um, okay, I'm exaggerating a bit, but they, they regularly seek help. But if you do see a patient with, who says, look, I've Googled something and I meet the symptoms and they are someone who who's always looking for a diagnosis in their lives if you tell them to consult a doctor and you can maybe tell them the reasons of seeking help earlier so for example in some conditions such as cancers we know that early diagnosis is key because you're able you're able to intervene earlier so don't um, you, know, you know don't scare them but say look there is what you're saying is, is quite serious. And wouldn't you just have that peace of mind by going to a doctor? So you don't need to refer them to a specific doctor, but you can tell them to, to seek medical help and say, look, I'm not a medical doctor. I can't tell you if you've got this condition or not. The best thing to do would be to seek medical attention. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for that advice. And we do see clients who self-diagnose and it's it's and, and uh, cyber cyberchondria the word makes so much sense it's the first time I've heard it but it makes absolute perfect sense when one does over google and over diagnose and comes in with a laundry list of possible conditions so thank you very much for that um, are there any participants who would like to ask other questions or make any other comments you're welcome to post in the chat box or Unmute yourself if you would like to, to go ahead. Genevieve, I see there is a question in the chat for Rizwan. Um, I don't know if you can see the chat box, Rizwan, from Zara. Okay, I'll read it out. Thank you. Hi there. I was just wondering what Dr. Rimini's opinion is regarding doctors' competence, resources to diagnose and treat, as well as ability to be sensitive towards disorders like this, for example, PCOS and endometriosis. You know, I, I really can't speak to doctors' competence because that's not something that I look at. Um, but I can say that sensitivity of doctors in treating conditions is so important. 
Um, a, a couple of years ago, we published a paper on, I think it was predictors of distress or, or yeah, among women with endometriosis. And we found that um, the relationship with the doctor or satisfaction with medical care was actually a significant predictor of symptoms of distress. So the poorer the care they received, the more likely they were to have distress. And so that shows you the importance, how significant that medical attention is and that attitude, that compassion. And, and I think that sometimes it's hard, you know, doctors are, I mean, I'm not making excuses for them, but a lot of them, um, if we, talk about doctors, 80% um, of the population seek medical attention in the public sphere, only 20% seek it in private sphere. And so we know that they are overworked. We know that they are short staffed and it's kind of difficult, even within doctors in private practice, some of them also just don't engage personally. And you know, that may be their own issues. And if a doctor isn't being sensitive, I'd actually tell, recommend that you find a doctor who, who is sensitive because that care, the way they care for you is very important. It's very important that as a patient, you feel seen and heard and cared for by your healthcare professional. And I mean, it's not always easy. I hope that answers your question. Zara? Does that answer your question? I think Zara is still with us. Yes. Yes, it does. Thank you. And I think, Dr. Rizwana, what you've just touched on about um, sensitivity and being treated for sensitivity, as opposed and distinguishing between the person and the diagnosis is something that is so important uh, for me emotionally. It took me years emotionally and psychologically to, to accept my diagnosis, um, be the, the psychological ramifications were in, in terms of hair loss, weight gain, et cetera, were more severe than the physical symptoms, which were already severe enough. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it is so important to have that support around you. And as you touched on earlier, when you were answering a question, having a partner or friends who are supportive, um, I took it to an extreme and became a vegetarian and bless my husband's heart. He does <laughs> to support me, he did too. And that really made the biggest, the biggest difference. So yeah, I think I think that sensitivity and really just caring for, for the patient um, and not just issuing a script is something that that we really do need to consider, and especially in our in our professions. Thank you so much for that. Are there any other questions or comments? No. Okay, so then we'll wrap it up. It is three minutes to three, so perfect timing. Dr. Rizwana, Laura Hartman, I cannot thank you enough for being here today, for answering these questions with very precise expertise. Thank you so much to you and to the SISA Health Psychology Special Interest Group. We will share the video on our YouTube channel and we will send it to the HPSIG. And also for all of our participants, uh, the student division will post the Instagram and Facebook and Twitter handles to the Health Psychology Special Interest Group social media accounts. So please keep an eye out for that. And please do contact us if you have any further questions. Thank you again so much for joining us. Really do appreciate it. It's been very informative. Thank you for taking the time. It's a pleasure. Bye. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks so much. Bye, everyone. Have a lovely day further. Bye.